Now, hear the good news and be not afraid. Good morning. Welcome to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Father P.J., good morning. Good morning. Let us begin in this day the memorial of San Ambrose, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, who made the Bishop San Ambrose a teacher of the Catholic faith and a model of apostolic courage, rise up in your church, men after your own heart, to govern her with courage and wisdom. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. San Ambrose, the patron from our cathedral in the Diocese of Des Moines. Yeah, so Ambrose is one of these characters that um, looms larger than life and is, I think, is frankly kind of hard for us today to wrap our heads around. Um, uh, you know, we talk about the fathers of the church, and that becomes kind of a you know, a catch-all phrase or group and I, in you know, old white guys that wrote church stuff or something. And that's, and that's not, that's not quite it. So Ambrose was, um, once upon a time poised to become one of the most powerful men in the Roman empire and abandoned a secular career in favor of the church, not at his own will, but because of the will of the people. So Ambrose was famously, uh, acclaimed bishop by the people following the death of the previous bishop. Um, and he wasn't even baptized yet. He was a catechumen. He was in our language in, in, in our CIA. And, uh, and the faith was so alive in him, so evident in him, that the people said, no, if there's anybody who can do this, if there's anybody who can help us, it's going to be him. And he, he worked tirelessly for decades to defend the faith. This is in a period uh, in which the faith was under serious attack um, from without by the, 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 the pagans who still lived in the empire and did not like the fact that the empire had become Christian and from within, especially by the Arians. So he was uh, thrown out of his own city several times um, and, uh, and exiled by the emperor and took on the emperor and the empress and all kinds of sort of adventures at court. Um, but what his greatest contribution probably to the history of the church is having been the one who baptized St. Augustine. Wow. So he was the one who was responsible for St. Augustine. So you think about your own parish priest or our own Bishop Johnson um, baptizing and receiving someone into the, into the church at Easter, and then that one growing up to become the next pope. That's something like like the role of St. Ambrose in the life of the early church. Uh, St. Augustine wasn't a pope, to be clear, but but of that kind of impact. Right? <laughs> Episcopal authority. Yeah. Um, do you have any clue, Father? I don't remember if we have any relic from St. Ambrose in St. Ambrose Cathedral here. That is an excellent question, and I don't know the answer to it. I also um, uh, we was, have the igne, ignus, uh, right from the cross, but I, the cross. but I but I I know there used to be. I don't know if there is now. We need Father Trevor for that. He'd be able to give us the the whole history. I also don't know exactly how Ambrose was chosen as the patron of the cathedral, but what I do know is that Father Mazzucchelli, who was the first priest who was assigned, who, who had the state of Iowa as his parish, basically. Um, uh, was from Milan, and he grew up literally in the shadow of San Ambrosio, of St. Ambrose's own church. Wow. Um, and I know that because I studied in Milan for, 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 for several months and, and saw the plaque where Mazzucchelli's birthplace is and, and the other churches right across the, right across the street. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, I've, I take great pride in our, in our cathedral being dedicated to St. Ambrose, and I really think, I think he should be more widely regarded. I think we should read, read Ambrose more because he's got a lot to teach us. And at the same time, the connection between St. Ambrose and the Blessed Virgin Mary is a remarkable manner as well. I mean, for each saint, the Blessed Virgin Mary represents a special uh, spot in the heart and the mind, of, and, and also in the pastoral service for these kind of saints, you know? Yeah, so, so Ambrose um, really is the father of Mariology, or the study of the Blessed Mother and her own kind of right in the Western Church. There's a kind of a different strain that, that, that arises in the Eastern Church. But Ambrose wrote a commentary on the Psalms, um, and, uh, and it's kind of all marrying themed. And I think it's really important, especially as we approach Christmas, that as, as the readers, as the listeners hear what I have to say, um, that they think about this in light of what I said before, Ambrose fighting heresy. So the Arians, who, he, who he's arguing against, don't think Jesus is God. And, and so, so by defending Mary as the mother of God, he's defending both Christ's divinity and his humanity. By, by, by laying our claim as to who Mary is, we're really laying a claim as to who Christ is. So, for example, in his commentary on Psalm 118, um, he, 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 he says, you know, this is really the spirit 
um, speaking through the psalmist sort of words of Christ, come receive me in that flesh which fell in Adam. Receive me not from Sarah, but from Mary, a virgin now incorrupt, a virgin by grace, entirely free from every stain of sin. So any notion that the Immaculate Conception yeah. was later piety or made up or not part of the early church, you know, this is a guy who's like a seventh, sixth or seventh generation Christian, right? Who, 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 who believes in the Immaculate Conception. This is in a, in a grateful and a tender manner how this connection is not accidentally, as we can presume based on, on the data, but it's more providentially and also prophetic in terms of the strongest devotion for the Immaculate Conception as well. Pretty much every claim, well, not pretty much, every claim that we make about the Blessed Mother doctrinally always has a correlate with her son, right? So it, it, it's all ultimately derived from what we're saying about her son. And the reason that's important is because it can, from the outside, if, if, if you don't have that firmly in mind, it can look like we're just saying a lot of fairly random, not very supportable things about Mary. Right. That's not the idea. We're really making very strong, strident claims about Jesus. And because Jesus is this, that, and the other way, so Mary must be. Um, it's not to make Mary another god. It's not to make her equal with her son. It's to insist that she's not. It's not idolatry. No, 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 no. But, it, but, but, but what, what it does, right, is it shows just how profoundly human nature changed when the word was made flesh. God penetrated the material world in, in a person in a way that had never been done before. And that changed everything. And the first recipient of that change, the first receiver of those graces, was the Blessed Mother. It's a beautiful how you explain that because sometimes people, when we express this deeply love uh, pertinence to the Blessed Virgin Mary, presuming that we are avoid the grandiose presence of Jesus Christ himself, and it's not. St. Louis, Saint Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort clearly said through Jesus, through Mary. That's right. What de Montfort says, you used the phrase yourself a minute ago. I'm not sure if you even realized it, right? You, you, you said the, the connection here is an accidental. It's not accidental. It's essential. Mary's role isn't, isn't lumped on top of what happens with Jesus. It's an, she's an integral part of God's plan. And that's good news for us because it means that we who have received similar graces, we have an integral part in God's plan too. Distinct from that of the Blessed Mother, of course, but just as real and just as eternal. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. At Intervisions Healthcare, we see patients with unplanned pregnancies from ages 12 to 43. An unplanned pregnancy is traumatic at any age. For that reason, we specialize in educating, encouraging, and empowering vulnerable and at-risk mothers facing an unexpected pregnancy with the medical information and services necessary for them to make an informed decision. For more information on the free medical services at Intervisions Healthcare or to support our mission or become a volunteer, visit IVHcare.org. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio comes from businesses and organizations who share in the mission of connecting listeners to Christ while connecting you to their products and services they provide. To learn more and support the businesses and organizations who support the Iowa Catholic Radio Network, visit iowacatholicradio.com to view our business sponsors. If you'd like more information on how your business or organization can become a business sponsor, contact Deacon Mark, 515-223-1150, 515-223-1150. Welcome back to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. We are approaching one of the amazing and unique solemnities in our church, the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Also, she is the patroness from the United States. Yeah, so, so um, her, her, her title is, as under the Immaculate Conception is named as the patronage of the United States, and, which is why this remains such an important holy day for us here in, in the U.S., it's a mandatory for Catholics, right? Yeah, unless it falls on funny days and that sort of thing. But yes, yeah. <laughs> so go to church this, this, this go to church this week. Um, you know, the Immaculate Conception uh, is uh, probably the most widely misunderstood dogma, um, and so it's important to get clear at the very outset what it is we're saying and what it is not that we're saying. Right. So, so while everything pertaining to the Blessed Virgin only derives because of her Son. The Immaculate Conception is not the conception of Jesus, but the conception of Mary, 
So this is this is what happened when St. Joachim and St. Anne made love and conceived a baby. Um, but different. But but so was, but but the conception was different. Not that the act of conception was different. That presumably worked more or less the ordinary way. Um, <laughs> but that the couple were older. So so the story of Mary's conception parallels that of the the prophet Samuel. Her name is her mother's name is Anna. Samuel's mother's name was Hannah. The the Magnificat of Mary parallels the song of Hannah from the Old Testament that we sing in the office. Right. Um, uh, Hannah couldn't have a baby. Anna couldn't have a baby. Um, they both went to pray over it. Uh, Hannah at the temple at Shiloh because the temple in Jerusalem hadn't been built yet. Uh, uh, Anne at the temple in, in, in Jerusalem. And then they both receive a baby. And both Hannah and Anna, they do something that most people today wouldn't do. You pray and pray and pray for a baby. Um, and then once you have the baby, you hold on to them as hard as you can, right? Nope. <laughs> they returned them to the temple. They, they gave them over in service to the Lord. Mary's immaculate conception is is the insistence that there was something about Mary from the very beginning. From the moment she came to be, God made her different, not less human, but more, a more authentic representation of what it is we all are meant to be, a nature untouched by sin, so distinct from the the nature you and I know, um, in as much as her nature would have reflected that of our unfallen parents. And because of that, she wasn't affected by concupiscence in the same way. So she wasn't, uh, her 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 desires were not disordered in the way yours and mine are. And as a result, she was able to remain free from sin for the whole of her life from the first moment of her conception until her assumption into heaven. Father, you mentioned briefly the dogma, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And also we have a special apparition that based on that apparition, she named it as I am the Immaculate Conception. We're talking about Lourdes, Lourdes right. and San Bernardita. So this is a very amazing connection. How the Blessed Virgin Mary wants to present herself not an extraordinary than Jesus Christ himself, as extraordinary manif God's manifestation through her obedience, accepting the Jesus Christ himself nativity. In the apparition to St. Bernadette, the, uh, at the time, you know, illiterate farm girl from, shepherd girl from Lourdes, um, Mary identifies herself as the Immaculate Conception. What she says is, I am the Immaculate Conception. Right. Which is, which is pretty technical theological language, right? Okay. So she, she, so she didn't say, I was immaculately conceived. No, in present time. Present. Right? And it, or, or, you know, my mother conceived me immaculately, both of which would have been true, but have missed the point of the dogma. Correct. Right? The, the, the dogma, right, is that, is that in Mary, things are different. And, be, and it's because things are different in Mary that she was competent or able to bear the one she bore into the world. Again, all of this, not really about Mary, really so that we can make the fullest claim that we can about Jesus. In Christ Jesus, God walked the earth. God wore diapers. God skinned his knees. God had friends and family. You know, um, the Eastern churches refer to St. Anne and St. Joachim as the holy and righteous ancestors of God or grandparents of God. This makes a great deal of sense. We call Mary mother of God all the time. It trips off our tongue so quickly we don't notice it. But that, that's exactly what we're saying. Because she's the mother of Jesus, who is God, Mary is the mother of God. Not the mother of God from all eternity, not the mother of God the Father, not the mother of God the Son, or not the mother of God the Spirit, but the mother of God the Son in his human nature Um uh, and and that that changes everything that a creature should now have at least in the temporal order a kind of superiority over the creator absolutely that the, that the creator should enter into a creature and, and 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 be born of the creature this is the reason historically you know we build churches in very um uh ignorant ways nowadays based on sort of strange ideas about the assembly historically churches are built the way they are with the virgin in the dome on purpose, right? The dome is a kind of womb and Christ is born from out the virgin so that the dome right over the sanctuary, it's not because you're worshiping Mary. It's because Christ is being born there. And that just as Christ was born, was received into the womb of the virgin and was born through her. So he is received in and born on the altar of our churches and for we who are privileged to receive Holy Communion, is born into our bodies 
and then and, and then into the world by ourselves. So that every one of us, Ambrose is the first one who says this, at least that I know of. Um, every one of us is called to be a Theotokoi. Theotokos. The, the, so Theotokos is the God bearer, the mother of God in Greek, where Theotokoi is, is plural. So we're called to be mothers of God or bearers of God into the world. So that just as Mary received the word into her womb, we receive him into our bellies and we carry him into the world. This is an amazing, amazing experience. Also, the connection between ecclesiastical architecture, the design, not accidentally, but also it's providentially to show the people of God the manifestation of the completely immaculate conception. At the same time, the Holy Eucharist, the center of our faith. Churches historically, right, are organized like on purpose. They didn't just decorate uh, randomly. Accidentally. And, and, and today that's often happens. Oh, I bought a nice statue. It looks good. Father. That's not <laughs> that's not the way churches are supposed to be. Your house may be, but not, not your church. No, your church. Beca because we're teaching the faith by this. It's much as we discussed um, uh, the first week of Advent with St. John the Baptist. Um, the, the, the Baptist, right, uh, so, so historically the virgin is placed to the right of the altar facing out and, yeah. and the Baptist to the left. Um, because they sit at the right and the left hand, right? They're, 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 it's a kind of order of priority. Well, we organize our spiritual lives in a similar way. And in order for that to happen, the, the one who comes first among us and first after Christ is his most blessed mother. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. Has anyone ever told you to pray about it and left you thinking, okay, but how? First, invite the Holy Spirit to be with you as you talk to God. Think about what is going on in your heart and mind. Be honest. Acknowledge to God what you're thinking, feeling, and desiring, because He wants you, the real you. Then, tell Him about what you're experiencing and entrust that to Him. Finally, let the Father love us. Ask yourself, how is God loving me right now? He is loving always. Sometimes we need to stop and think of our blessings, because that is where we can find God. Hi, this is Matt Wilkham from the Catholic Morning Show. Join me along with Father P.J. McManus for Iowa Catholic Radio's Footprints of God Holy Land Pilgrimage, November 2023. Expert guides Steve and Janet Ray will lead us on this spiritually enriching biblical adventure. We'll visit Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus said, You are Peter. Nazareth, including the Church of the Annunciation, plus the House of the Holy Family. Space is limited. Early bird pricing available. Full brochure and details at iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome back to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Father PJ, this coming Sunday, the Liturgy of the Word for this third Sunday of Advent have a very interesting data for us through the reading of the book of the prophet Isaiah. But before that, we use pink vestments. Yeah. How so, is that? <laughs> so the third Sunday of, uh, of Advent, Rose Sunday or Gaudete Sunday, Gaudete Sunday. Um, uh, is that means it, it, um, rejoice and, rejoice, it's, and rejoice. it's the imperative. Imperatives are really important in church talk. Imperatives are orders, right? So, so, so this isn't um, be happy if you'd like or be joyful if you can manage or something like it. It's a command. Rejoice. Um, the same thing happens um, uh, in the middle of the mass at the offertory, right? Uh, pray brethren or or, or manos. this isn't a request it's like a military command pray pray order pray that this my sacrifice and yours so the apostle right th this comes from the entrance antiphon which probably most of us won't hear but that's okay um uh it comes from the entrance antiphon right which is rejoice jerusalem um uh because your savior comes right so it's so 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 it's 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 kind of the last call to the city uh, get ready for a party because things are about to things are about to happen, and that tracks very well with the prophecy that comes to us from Isaiah. So, let us begin with the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter thirty-five, verses one to six and ten. The desert and the parched land will exult; the steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given him, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the hands that are feeble. Make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong. Fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication. With divine recompense, he comes to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf be cleared. Then will the lame leap like a stag and the tongue of the mute will sing. 
those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowded with everlast, crowned with everlasting joy. They will meet with joy and gladness, sorrow and mourning will flee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. First of all, it's not amazing how poetry, description, and eloquent Holy Spirit inspiration that engage us and we want more. Let, let me more, let me more. So again, to the previous comment, rejoice, rejoice. Wow. So, so Isaiah here, um, it's worth saying, I think at the outset, um, you know, the, 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 the readings at mass, we're very used these days to just calling them first and second readings. Um, uh, that's a r- relatively new thing. Historically, they're known as prophecies and epistles even though not all of the works that would be called prophecies are strictly prophetic, like you might read from the book of Genesis, but it's still considered a prophecy. And the reason for that was because um, uh, Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, the Torah and the, and, the, and the historical books were understood in some way to always be pointing to Christ. And this is in no place more clear than during Advent when we read so much from the book of the prophet Isaiah Isaiah was called by the church fathers, the fifth gospel, because it seems so clearly to point to the events in the life of the Lord, both the events of his, uh, of Mary's pregnancy and birth, the events of his earthly life, and then especially the moments of his death, which is why Isaiah figures so prominently both in Advent and in Lent, both at Christmas time and at Eastertide. It's beautiful as well, how it's an uh, kindness or better to use the expression in English, friendly invitation Mm. to say, wake wake up, wake up, wake up. Something good happened. Be ready, be ready. Prepare yourselves. And sometimes this uh, dormition in this world keep us far away to enjoy the mysteries that coming up with the nativity of the Lord, you know? I think one way of reading this, I mean, so clearly the poetry here is, is exceptional. And our ears should perk up at certain things. Like it's not a, a, it's not an accident that um, that the prophet here references Carmel and Sharon. Now Carmel is the same as like is Mount, Mount Car- Carmel. Yeah, Mount right. Carmel. So, so, so the Marian connection here is right out of the gate, right? As well as Sharon, because she's later referred to as the Rose of Sharon. This drawing on on imagery from uh, the the Song of Songs. Um, the but but the way that he sort of piles. Uh, analogy on analogy, metaphor on metaphor, right? It's almost like a little kid. Little kid goes to a movie, Total. and then they come back after and they say, <laughs> you know, and, and then and then Batman beat up the the bad guys in the alley, and, and, then, you, and, and, then, and then he did this, and then he did this, and then he did this, and then this, and, and this, and, 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 and the desert's going to have water, and the step is going to bloom, and and, 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 and and there's going to be flowers or there aren't flowers, and then people that can't sing are going to sing, and then the blind people are going to see, and the deaf people are going to hear, and, and again, and again, and again, and, and, and that's the sort of enthusiasm that you've got rolling through the prophet right. Isaiah. This text also, and that same kind of pattern, um, is the origin of the structure behind the Gloria. So the glory of the Mass, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people, Correct. And goodwill. Now, the, those first two lines obviously are drawn from, uh, from the Gospel of Luke and the angel song to the shepherds, but, but the rest of the hymn is intended to be the same thing, which is why it can feel a little repetitive. It is on purpose, much like this passage is repetitive, but it's in order to kind of drive the point home. And call my attention, I, I know uh, about the, the explanation about the poetry, but they will be bloom with abundant flowers. And flowers, again, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And again, mention Carmel, as you mentioned that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful connection that always the Blessed Virgin Mary, in certain ways, approach to also encourage us to in, prepare ourselves. In time, in the order of salvation, in time... Uh, Mary precedes the experience anybody has of Jesus because she has to give birth to him first, right? And in the order of grace, um, uh, this isn't exactly day fide, day, but it's the, the, the common teaching of most of the fathers. Um, Mary's intercession precedes the experience of, uh, of Christ and conversion. Now, for most of us, that happens well after baptism because we're baptized as infants and all that. But, but, but it just goes to show that Mary's involvement doesn't stop. That She's not an historical artifact or an accident to the story of Christ. She's essential not only to his story, but to ours as well. Iowa Catholic Radio. Father, before the 
concluding our prayer, and could you please send us with your blessing? May the peace and blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Be not afraid. Be not afraid on Iowa Catholic Radio. Jesus is on the way to encounter you. Go forward and be not afraid.